Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's Cuppa Club, which is uh, coincidentally in line with the London Climate Action Week. So um, on the road to COP26, we're going to be looking at investing in local solutions to global challenges. And uh, joined by a really great panel today, we're gonna to be hearing a lot from them. Um, welcome everybody, just in the nick of time. And um, we will be running for an hour today. Um, please do submit some questions in the chat function if you would like to, and I'll feed those in or address the panelists um, at the end of the session. Um, just to say, obviously this isn't any financial advice in any way, and uh, this isn't a financial promotion. So uh, we're just going to be learning some more about this area and also um, hear from our great panelists. So um, without further ado, uh, let's just say hi to everybody. So perhaps we'll go um, Helen, Rick, Andy, Nick, and then Marianne. Um, and if you could just say uh, hello and who you are, and then uh, I'll give an introduction. Hi, I'm Helen Woodcock. I'm from Kindling Trust and Kindling Farm, and I'm a co-founder of both those organisations. We'll be chatting more about that. Hi there, I'm Rick Casali. I'm a trustee of Carbon Copy, and it, Carbon Copy is a climate action charity. And we focus on helping local councils, community groups, companies uh, work collaboratively on local projects. Off you go, Andy. Hi, hi everybody. So my name is Andy O'Brien and I'm a, a co-founder and director of Bristol Energy Cooperative. Hi, my name is Nick Robbins. I'm uh, a professor in practice for sustainable finance at the London School of Economics. Um, uh, the LSE, we're part of a group called the Place-Based Climate Action Network, and uh, I uh, am uh, chairing the finance platform for that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Thanks. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Marianne Heasley. I am a, a co-founder and director at Power of Retrofit, which is uh, a new service for householders wanting to retrofit their homes. Based in Manchester, um, has been set up as a collaboration between Carbon Corp and Urbed, who I also work for. That's lovely, thanks everyone. Um, so we just to say as well, we were to be joined by uh, Luke Murphy today from the uh, Institute for Public Policy uh, Research, but unfortunately he has come down with a migraine. So I'll be just covering off a few points from his excellent report um, and we'll send through a link afterwards as well. So uh, in the events of the past year, um, I think that it has driven home the importance of communities and certainly at Essex we've seen renewed enthusiasm in financing and investing in communities. So in London and across the UK community organisations are taking grassroots action to challenge some of the biggest problems we face as a society including climate change and I think we've become acutely aware in the lead up to COP that uh, the responsibilities of governments and global leaders to take decisive action when it comes to climate change is extremely important, but we're also seeing a surge in community empowerment. So people from all walks of life taking matters into their own hands and really getting stuck into um, providing a community owned renewable energy, uh, approaching new approaches to sustainable land and food production, retrofitting uh, energy efficiency technologies to homes, and providing fair access to electric charging infrastructure for cars uh, to fuel the clean transport revolution, which is excellent. And we're gonna be hearing from some of the organizations who are really um, doing well in this area uh, in a moment. So in this panel discussion, we're going to be looking at the appetite for local action, um, how and why it works, and to celebrate some of these pioneering uh, initiatives who are trying to address climate action, uh, climate change by taking action on their doorstep. Um, so we'll talk about how um, power is held within the hands of communities to start making a difference um, whilst we wait for government to take action. 
So looking at these everyday um, people making incredible uh, strides to deliver on these projects and how these organizations are actually funded by everyday people uh, who are investing alongside uh, institutional investors using their own money to take a stand against the climate crisis um, and who are really looking at um, trying to use money as a, as a power for good uh, and that's very much what we hope to inspire within Essex uh, with our tagline of course of making money do good. So um, Nick I'd like to come to you first so if you could talk to us about um, the role of communities and people power finance to accelerate our net zero ambitions. Um, and what are the key barriers to achieving this? And what do you think the, some of the solutions are? Well, thanks, Lisa. Really good to be with you and the rest of the panel and uh, people on the line. So, I mean, I, just to sort of, I suppose, kick off um, that uh, we're just taking the net zero side, so driving our emissions uh, down to zero as a country well before 2050. Um, this is the most important decade. Um, investment precedes emissions reduction. So a report I did uh, for the Committee on Climate Change, the Road to Net Zero Finance, set out that annual extra net zero investment needs to grow fivefold this decade from uh, 10 billion a year to 50 billion a year, and then it will peak in the 2030s. So actually, this is the this is the decade of, of big uh, effort. Um, and, and obviously, we're, we're seeing lots of uh, take up um, by, by banks, by investors, by other parts of the financial system, um, by the Treasury, and, and so on. We'll have a green sovereign bond issued by the government, uh, and so on. But I think the, the community uh, dimension is, is, really, um, is really important. Just to, as a sort of little highlight of what the work we do, um, the Place-Based Climate Action Network has been set up particularly to uh, support uh, particular communities uh, and regions to take place-based action. Uh, and we're working particularly in, in Leeds and Yorkshire, uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, uh, and also in other parts of, of, of the country, um, including Surrey and many other parts of the country. Um, and I work on the, the finance area, which is essentially how do we connect uh, the increasing desire of investors, individuals, uh, but also individuals in their pension funds and so on to finance net zero with actually the projects on the ground, um, which, which are going to be needed. So at the community uh, community level. So that's the sort of work we've been doing. We've also set up a, a group called the Finance and Just Transition Alliance, which again is really thinking about the justice part of, of finance. So this is a bit of context. This is the big decade um, uh, that we need to, need to shift. Just uh, I suppose maybe a bit why the community dimension is so important, because because clearly you could think, well, isn't this all going to be done by, by big financial institutions and, and, and so on? So I suppose the first thing is that communities are a source of ambition. Actually, this is where a lot of the ambition uh, for net zero and other forms of action, whether on nature or resilience or indeed on sort of social inclusion, that's coming. So that is really important to make sure we have both businesses, but also financial mechanisms that actually enable that ambition to be realized and scaled up. So that's, that's, that's number one. The second is clearly community-based action is, is often very place-based. And that's a really important piece of this, that actually, although we have national targets and global targets, actually the delivery of that will happen in places very different, whether rural or post-industrial or urban, suburban, uh, different issues in terms of, of, of uh, justice issues, in terms of uh, racial diversity and so on and so forth. So that's, that's, that's really, uh, really important. And then that flows into the inclusion aspect, a core part of, of, of the community pile. Uh, investment strategy is really closing this often artificial divide between green investing and, and sort of social impact investing. And then finally, why is the sort of community uh, investing so, so important is because actually communities have financial resources. A piece of work that um, Abundance did for us for, for PCAN highlighted that on average for every 100,000 people in the UK, there's about four billion pounds worth of investable uh, assets pensions, ISAs, bank savings, and so on. But we know that precious little of that money is actually uh, devoted to uh, investments in, in people's own communities uh, and regions. So I think the work of ethics, of abundance, and, and all the people on the panel to actually have mechanisms which can enable people to invest in their communities in climate action, but also in economic and social renewal is absolutely, uh, absolutely key. And we've seen uh, mechanisms such as the community municipal investments on the sort of local authority um, 
the site. So I think why this is so uh, so so important. I think some of the challenges that remain clearly is actually building up um, those, those pieces of sort of connective tissue between enterprises and community groups and sources of finance. So we need platforms who can connect um, people who have um, finance with those who, who need it. Uh, and I think also we're going to need to have sort of community finance and community uh, investment being, being really recognised as a priority by the government, as a way of enabling um, its, its strategy. So a big thing coming down this year uh, will be the government's net zero strategy, which will come out before uh, COP. Um, and interesting report from the Committee on Climate Change uh, just last week was doing a sort of scorecard of government progress, highlighting the importance of net zero strategy. But um, a couple of things they really highlighted that really need to sort of come forward and we, where we need more work is firstly a plan for just transition to make sure that the drive to green also um, drives down inequality and doesn't necessarily lead to stranded workers, stranded communities, stranded regions, but also a framework for local delivery. Again, that is where I think this the, the focus on community finance, community enterprise really, really comes in. Um, so this is a really important moment to really show the success of what's been happening, highlight some of those barriers and get it locked into national uh, policy. So a couple of sort of thoughts as we sort of, what, what could that mean? I think clearly there's a role for, for government. I think maybe agencies like the British Business Bank, which is there to support uh, SMEs, um, to actually say, should they have a particular focus on supporting social enterprises, community-based enterprises and so on as part of their, their rollout of their, their areas? Is there work in which uh, community uh, initiatives, uh, finance and community enterprises can be linked maybe with anchor institutions in, in regions? I, I, I think the potential to maybe to partner with, for example, water utilities really interesting large landholders they're going to be around whatever happens in those regions are there areas where actually partnering with with uh, big anchor institutions maybe some of the public sector health health sector or, or, or others and so on i think that's another another clearly we have community development finance institutions which are doing great work uh, in these areas i think there's, there's more to, more to be seen there and then one of the things we're developing in this pcan network the pace based climate action network is what we're calling place based climate uh, finance platforms because we do see there's a, a, a missing middle, that there's a lot of energy in communities, in local areas and so on to, to, to really move forward. But actually developing that project pipeline, developing uh, maybe some, some of the, the developing the projects, maybe bringing in, in, in involved sort of um, public finance, blending finance, reducing risk and so on. That, that isn't really there. We don't really have that. So maybe at a, at, a, at a regional level, we could have that sort of platform which could work with local authorities, with communities, with government groups, the new UK Infrastructure Bank, with private finance to actually build that really exciting uh, blend of, of, of projects. So that's one, th one thing that we're, uh, we're going to be um, developing, uh, developing this year. Uh, and then I'll just add that in the sort of report of the Finance and Just Transition Alliance, uh, which will come out before COP, this community dimension will be very strong. So um, back to you, Lisa. I hope that, that yeah. was set out the outline. Thank you. Perfect, great. That's really excellent. And some um, some really interesting thoughts there. I'm um, going to pick up on a couple of those a bit later. Perhaps we could talk about the Green Sovereign Bond, because I know that uh, more details about that is are coming out imminently. Um, and I know Andy was talking just earlier before the call started about more uh, development capital and risk uh, capital that's needed to get some of these community projects off the ground as well. So I think we'll pick up on a couple of those points in a minute. Um, so just um, going to give some highlights of the um, great uh, report that was done um, by the IPPR. Uh, called the Climate Commons, we'll send a link round, um, and it's about how communities can thrive in a, in a climate changing world. And um, building on what uh, Nick has said, um, I think there are some of the key points are, there are opportunities as well as threats when it comes to uh, the climate crisis and communities. So there is an opportunity to reshape local areas in a way that improves health and well-being, tackles inequalities and improves quality of life. Um, there will be uh, 
great impact on people and communities, perhaps far more than uh, to date, uh, in terms of the next wave of decarbonisation. And so obviously we've got to engage communities and bring them along on the journey as well. Um, there's already great progress that's being made, uh, and we're going to look at some examples uh, of those in terms of local projects, uh, what's being done in terms of wind and solar, uh, community land trusts, local food cooperatives, low carbon homes, etc. So some great examples to talk about. Um, one point is that climate action isn't often the primary goal for many successful uh, community led initiatives. Um, and emission reductions are often a co-benefit. I think that's quite an interesting point. Um, at present, we are neither making the most of the opportunities available, nor managing the unequal negative impacts of the climate crisis and the transition. Um, so we're too dependent on top-down policies um, and that perhaps we need more market-based solutions. Um, and we need to also look at behavioral change um, to really get to those targets. Um, and then um, for communities to thrive in this changing world, they have to be given greater ownership, not just over the process of the transition, but of the assets and the benefits that arise from those. Um, so I think those are really good points from the report. Um, there's some key findings and there's a lot more work to be done in terms of um, I think uh, equality, uh, inclusion and diversity to make sure that we are um, really taking everyone on the journey with us. Um, and perhaps any of the organizations speaking could sort of mention that point and how you're helping to try and address that. Um, that volunteer engagement is absolutely crucial uh, for these organ organizations, but actually we can't just rely on voluntary support all the time and that we need to better resource people, um, both so that they have really strong organizations internally, but also uh, looking at getting better external support um, and professional support, particularly in terms of complex planning issues and um, legal issues uh, so that we can make sure that the vast proportion of these projects are actually um, successful because so much work is, um, is put into these um, projects. So that's just a flavor of, um, of what the report um, outlines. Um, so picking up on that then, we need to obviously um, grow the number of organizations, we need to scale them, and we need to take it to a whole new level. So I'd like to uh, next introduce um, Rick, who's going to talk about carbon copy and the work that you're doing to um, scale for success. So over to you, Rick. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, and Angie, if I may just connect some of the points that you were just talking about uh, when you were recapping the, uh, the report, the Community Commons report, because um, one of the key takeaways uh, for me is the literal ownership by communities of various assets. But I think there's also a wider figurative uh, ownership in terms of involvement in uh, the local climate action plan. And so I think it's very important to appreciate the context in which communities as well as companies are, are leading on local climate action. And that context is uh, the local climate action plan that has been stewarded by the council uh, in consultation with key stakeholders, because that provides the framework against which all these initiatives are taking place. And as we know, just in terms of giving you a few key statistics, we have across the whole of the UK about 380 principal councils. Three quarters of those have declared uh, an ecological and, and climate crisis. Uh, but three quarters of those who have declared have since gone on in collaboration with local stakeholders to set a net zero target of 2030. So that's 20 years ahead of national. And that's just one indication of the level of ambition that there is at a local level. If you look at it another way, um, over half 
of all these uh, local climate action plans cover the entire local area. So again, these are not plans that are simply to do with the council specific assets. These are plans that cover everybody that are living in the local area. And perhaps the most exciting um, statistic, because we have mapped all the, um, or, sorry, we've gathered together all the local climate action plans uh, into one place. It's on carboncopy.eco. It's a freely available resource for people to look at. And the most exciting uh, statistic for me is that across the UK, we have over a hundred local authority areas that have set a net zero target of 2030 for the whole of their local area. So in each of those uh, areas, clearly we need to have all the stakeholders coming together and to work in a very ambitious way because it's a very exciting target. And to be honest, we're not really sure how we're gonna get there, but that doesn't stop us from having that kind of a stretch target. And I think having those kind of stretch goals then helps focus minds, helps people to go further faster. So from a carbon copy perspective, where we're very much looking at the importance and the role of collective local action within the, the bigger framework of systemic change, it's very exciting to see this level of ambition playing out. So I think that's one important context in terms of when people are leading with various projects, how does that tie in with their local climate action plan? Because often what they are doing are integral components of it. And the opportunity to tie back to what Nick was saying earlier is to work, figure out how this connective tissue comes together, how we actually make the various stakeholders that are essentially working in tandem uh, to work a bit more closely and cohesively together. One of the things that we're doing at Carbon Copy is we are encouraging people to share what they are doing so that we have a hub, so we can just accelerate the real world learning and practices that are happening because it's pretty much happening all at the same time and we don't have time to reinvent the wheel. So the opportunity in terms of scaling is in part one of how do we better share the knowledge that's practical knowledge that people are gaining in real time. So we're just about to hear from three really great people leading three very different initiatives. That's exactly the kind of thing that from a carbon copy perspective, we want to broadcast to encourage other people to copy or adapt. When, when we look at, we've got uh, over hundred or so um, initiatives that have been published by people leading the projects. Uh, and when we kind of look at some of the common threads uh, across that, that set, I think there's a couple of things worth highlighting. Um, one is that um, not everybody undertakes these initiatives uh, in order to address the climate crisis directly. It can be a consequence. So for instance, uh, you know, there's examples, for instance, of people looking to alleviate, say, food poverty in their local area. And that has benefits in terms of how they do so, uh, in terms of reducing environmental impact, et cetera. And I think that's a really important point to make because when we look at how we talk to people beyond the eco bubble, we need to appreciate that a lot of these initiatives that do have a positive impact and in terms of addressing the climate are done so for other reasons. So this notion of co-benefits, we may even think a bit more broadly about uh, potentially addressing the climate crisis as the co-benefit of something that is a more immediate priority within the local community or local area. So that's quite an exciting way of extending the reach and involving more people in, in this overall aim that we have. And the other observation I have in terms of what people are sharing with us is to try and draw out what some of the key drivers of change are. You know, how are people uh, enabling this connect collective action to happen? Certainly uh, funding is one, and that's clearly something we're gonna come back to and talk about the various ways that you can get funding for projects. But it's also interesting to see how people are taking an approach that leads perhaps on say education and education being the key driver. Uh, there are other initiatives where people are just leading through inspiration. Uh, other people, it's almost like a build it and they will come type of mentality. So there's some very different ways in which people are taking action. I think the most encouraging takeaway for me is that people are acting now. 
Um, clearly, there's a, a real urgency behind doing so. And what I see at the local level is we are getting ahead. And I'm hoping that that will send a strong signal in terms of up to policymakers that clearly we need a more positive policy environment, but people aren't waiting for that to happen. Um, and so lots of very inspirational stories. Uh, and I, I do encourage people to go and have a look uh, on carbon copy. The intent really being not only to be inspired by what people see there, but if you can copy and adapt, copy and yep. adapt it. Perfect, great, that's, that's excellent, Nick. And I think that gives a, a really great backdrop um, to the organizations to introduce themselves and say a bit more about what they're doing. Um, and yeah, absolutely builds on what, what Nick was saying um, and also what the, um, what the report also has, has published. So um, we'll go um, Andy first from, from Beck and then we'll go Helen Kindling and then we'll go Marianne People Power Retrofit. So um, if you'd like to give us a, a spin around your organization, um, that would be brilliant. Andy. Okay, thanks Lisa. Uh, yeah, hello everybody. My name's Andy O'Brien. I'm a, a director and co-founder of Bristol Energy Cooperative. Uh, we're established back in 2011. So actually next month we're 10 years old. So uh, yeah, that's something to celebrate. But it's also scary when you think what we need to do in the next 10 years in comparison with what we've managed to do in the previous 10 years. So, uh, yeah, lots to get on with. So, um, yeah, our mission when we set up was to invest in renewables, cut carbon and build community. And we are a community benefit society. So we've now got over a thousand members and uh, we've so far raised over 14 million pounds uh, for our projects. We've got 16 projects, vast majority of them solar. We do rooftop solar, solar farms. Uh, we've also got a battery storage project. And of that money that we've raised, about half of that's come from the community sector uh, through shares and bonds. And uh, quite a lot of that has actually been raised through the FX platform, so thanks to FX. Uh, and then the other half has come through more sort of traditional bank loans uh, and also some, some loans from, from social funders. Um, so our, our projects run to make a make a return, uh, to make a return to our investors, um, but also because we're set up as a, as a community benefit society, as I said, we provide physical, environmental, social benefits to that community. So, uh, so far we've facilitated over £250,000 of, of funds that have gone directly to the local community. Uh, we have a, our own community benefit fund where we share with another co-op, local co-op, um, that local people can apply to for funding to actually do their do their own uh, schemes that have some sort of renewable uh, or environmental. Uh, uh, yeah, it's based on based on on, on having an environmental uh, benefit. So yeah, that's a key part of what we do. So yeah, we've done quite a bit. Um, in terms of how we do it, well, we're now we've got three people who are employed. So I'm I'm fully employed by the co-op. Uh, we've also got a couple of other staff who who we pay who, who prefer to work contracted. So yeah, we do have paid staff now. It's taken us a while to get there, uh, but we do know that if we are going to scale up, we need to have a much bigger office uh, and staff staff grouping than we currently do. So at the moment we're developing more solar, uh, a hydro scheme, and also some very innovative uh, microgrid projects, which are really quite cutting edge. And the other thing we're doing, and this is, we felt, this is actually something we started in back in 2016. Uh, we, we helped set up an organization called Zero West. And this is a collaboration to accelerate the zero carbon transition in our part of the world, in the West of England. And it's bringing together the commercial sector, the community sector, and the four West of England local authorities. Because back then we just felt there wasn't collective action with all these people linking together. And there wasn't, there wasn't really a plan and there wasn't any clarity about how anybody was actually gonna deliver a plan to any sort of time frame. So we brought lots of people together who we knew about or who other people had recommended us. Uh, got about 100 different people and organizations in a room to say 
come on, how can we do this better? And through that, we actually set up a, a community interest company and that's up and running now. And it's beginning to do some really quite interesting things. As ever, it needs funding. We've done it on a shoestring. We are constantly asking the commercial sector to put some money in. They never quite do it. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a model that I think could be used anywhere across the country. And we can see there's some real examples of just when you bring people together in a room, magical things happen because different people have got different assets, whether that's financial assets, whether it's personnel assets, knowledge, skills, it just, just needs bringing together. So yeah, we, we know we all need, know we need to scale up to meet this net zero challenge. And you know, for us, collaboration is key, innovation is key. So the challenges, but they're also huge opportunities. Um, and you know, it's fascinating to work in this sector. So, you know, what's going on, what you see happening on a daily basis and the changes and the enthusiasm, especially over the last year, you really see it picking up. And you see business beginning to really uh, step up. And I think for them, I think for big businesses, I think they know in a way how to do some of this, but for smaller businesses, I think they may be struggling to know quite how they can get involved or they don't necessarily have the in-house staff to, you know, to do their own sort of carbon assessments. So they're the sort of organizations that we want to work with. And also obviously what government needs to be doing is, is giving them a lot more support than the government currently does. And just to be a bit negative for a minute, uh, the community energy sector does work on a shoestring. It's been battered over the last few years by government policy. And there's so many people out there who had good stuff going that they've had to stop. Mm. It doesn't make sense financially right now because, because the incentives still aren't there. We still know there are incentives out there for fossil fuels, but the incentives for renewables and for community sector stuff where you work very hard on a shoestring to get stuff going over a number of years that support isn't there right now. So the, very recently, the Environmental Audit Committee did an inquiry and interviewed lots of community uh, energy practitioners about how that sector could, uh, how a sector could be improved, how we could remove the barriers which is stopping the sector going forward. So the committee chair has now written, uh, there's a report out now, he's written to, to the, uh, the government minister for base on this with a whole lot of really good recommendations uh, I think I think we're going to circulate the, the link that, that you can read the, the chair's letter. So that's gone off to base, and their initial response, to be honest, was lukewarm. I think that's the best I can say. So they really need to step up. The easy wins, quick wins, cheap wins in comparison with what what we spend on all sorts of other things, and the government just needs to get its act together on that one. Um, and then the other area where we really, really like to see things move and this is around the, the collaboration around the finance, is the commercial sector. Uh, so I mentioned, you know, we, 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 we do collaborate as much as we can, but on, on the whole, where we've raised money for, and from a sort of a crowdfunding point of view, it's, it's mainly been from the general public. Mm. Um, and what we really want is, is for business to be coming on board more, investing in those sort of schemes, but also providing some of that risk capital, development capital, which is hard to do on the straight, like FX fundraise. We're, we're tending to be coming, coming with a, a project which is pretty much ready to go, but that's taken like maybe two years to get to that stage. And we need, we need businesses to come in and offer patient capital that will help us to develop those schemes in a much quicker way than we're currently doing because it takes so such a long time and there's so many people who haven't got access ready access to that sort of patient capital yeah thank you andy i think that's a that's a brilliant summary of your uh, great work that you you've done so far and that you continue to do modest as ever um so thank you for everything that you do and i'm also really interested to hear about zero west as well which sounds like a really innovative approach to, you know, I mean, it seems very sensible, right, to bring all those players in the room together. And I think you're right to, to get commercial businesses to start collaborating more with communities is absolutely essential in the absence of, uh, you know, stronger policy from, from government. 
Um, so let's pick up on that risk capital point again in a bit. But in the meantime, let's move over to Helen at Kindling. Um, Helen, if you'd like to give us a whistle stop of your organisation and what you've been doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, really interesting to hear from Andy and very, loads of similarities, actually, in terms of kind of where we kind of came from of getting everyone in the room, the kind of buyers and the growers and all that sort of thing to try and uh, to try and solve the problem of <laughs> our hugely unsustainable mainstream food system. Uh, so basically, um, Kindling Trust has been going for about 13, 14 years. Uh, and uh, we've, we've just set up Kindling Farm um, and are hoping to buy a farm to, uh, to establish a blueprint for food and farming. Um, but basically over the last decade, we've been running a number of practical food and farming uh, initiatives with the aim of creating a fairer and more sustainable food system. And that's uh, just hugely important um, for lots of reasons that I'm sure you're all very aware of, but a big one being that food and the food and farming system is responsible for over 25% of our carbon emissions. Um, that is really, really hard for sustainable farmers to make a living. Uh, and to cover their own cost of production um, and at the same time we've got people not able to afford to you know feed their own families never mind choose uh, ecologically and socially just food um, and what we feel is we need to be able to have a, a food system that is you know where people is not just the right the the privilege that gets to eat good food it's the right of everyone um, but at the same time we can and we can help our farmers to make a living and we can um, stop having such a negative ecological impact. Um, so the, the basically the way we're trying to do this is through a number of projects, which is training a new generation of uh, farmers up in ecological farming. It's creating the markets that are fairer markets um, for their produce. Uh, and also increasing access um, through kind of we've got a, we've set up a couple of cooperatives that engage uh, restaurants, but also the University of Manchester and schools, um, but and also the members are growers. So it's creating understanding throughout the food supply system. And then we've got a vegbot scheme and uh, also do social prescribing and wellbeing work and lots of community engagement and in in a way of trying to make it more accessible. Um, and, and to bring people with us. I'm not sure who it was that said this, but we have to, you know, there's a real temptation of ha like the with the crisis that we've got in terms of biodiversity and climate change to just go, we need to change this as quickly as possible. But unless we engage people, we're, we're not going to change it. The, the change isn't going to be sustainable and long term. Um, so the next stage of what we're doing is we're looking for a 100 acre, 100 plus acre farm uh, where we're going to have this blueprint for food and farming through agroforestry, which I won't even start on because I'll be here all day, um, but growing veg and cereals between rows of trees, um, also doing Centre for Social Change to kind of support the change makers and engage communities and a social enterprise hub. And a really crucial part of all of this is that it's going to be owned by the community by its members so at the moment we've got a got this uh, shameless plug in the background but we've got a um, community shares campaign running on fx uh, it's just until saturday so <laughs> have a look oh skype's going sorry um yeah so we've and we are that uh and the idea is that basically we together as a community of members by this farm and create this uh, create this different food system together. And the reason that we think investment and community shares is important is because basically, if people invest rather than donate money, they're kind of more likely to stay engaged and to want the farm to succeed, but also more likely to want to change things on a larger scale and replicate it on a wider scale, which is part of the whole aim of what we're doing. We want little kindling farms or equivalents all over the country. Mm. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Marianne, over to you. Hello. Um, thank you for asking me to um, to speak on this panel. There's some obviously really interesting stuff going on all over the country. Um, our and it's kind of nice to be on a panel with someone else from Manchester as well. To be honest, <laughs> hey Helen. Um, our focus at, at People Powered Retrofit is is really on um, 
everyone's homes. Uh, as I'm sure a lot of people will be aware, about 20% of um, our carbon emissions in this country are to do with running our homes, heating and lighting and powering them. Um, and that's partly due to the fact we have some of the worst housing stock in the whole of Europe. It's leaky, it's not very well insulated. Um, and we're also still mostly running it off um, fossil gas uh, boilers. Um, so we clearly need to do something about that. Um, and it will require a scale of uh, work and a scale of ambition that's much greater than what's been done today. And that there have been improvements over the last 20 years. We have made our housing stock more efficient, but it's not enough for uh, getting to where we need to, to meet our climate change um, commitments. And it, uh, it requires a degree of uh, a holistic view that probably hasn't been done to date either. We've kind of viewed homes as a kit of parts. So you swap one thing out, you swap an old inefficient boiler out, you put a more efficient boiler in, jobs are good. And, um, it's actually to get to the next stage, it's going to be a bit more complicated than that. Um, and I think as people have already talked about as well, it's not just about carbon emissions for a lot of people who are interested in doing work in their homes. It's also about making them more comfortable, making them healthier. Um, for some, it's about fuel poverty and simply being able to afford to run their home uh, in a way that keeps them safe and warm. Um, there have been over the years and there continue to be this, this year, there's quite a, a large program um, for tackling some of these issues in social housing, uh, but there hasn't been that much that has had that much success to date, at least um, with private householders. Um, so far, the people who've done some of the scale of work that's required have tended to be pioneers and people have been willing to become experts themselves and we think it's a bit unrealistic to expect that of everyone. Um, obviously, there have been things like the Green Homes Grant and the Green Deal, which uh, haven't exactly been great adverts for retrofit and we believe haven't tackled some of the issues, um, which aren't necessarily just about finance, although that is part of it. But there are people who have money and want to invest in their homes, but they're really uncertain of what to do. Um, don't want to make a mistake, make anything worse, end up with damn problems, that kind of thing. And they also struggle to find the people to, both to advise on it and to carry out the work. Um, so People Powered Retrofit is really a response to that. It's something that we've been um, piloting for the last couple of years in Manchester between um, the organisation that I've worked for for the last 10 years or so, um, Urbed, who... Uh, I'm a, an architect by training, so we've got a lot of technical expertise, um, understand a lot of what, what needs to be done to make retrofit work technically, uh, alongside Carbon Co-op, who are a community benefit society, and they've done a lot of work on engagement and systems and how um, they're actually a, a member-based organisation as well, uh, people who want to do something about climate change. So People Powered Retrofit has been set up to um, kind of offer specialist advice in this particular area. We know it, it works. We know that there's an interest in it. We've helped to deliver projects. We've currently got about 70 clients in the service. So it's a, it's a service that we've been designing. Um, but what we really need to do now is scale that up. Uh, and that's about building the technical expertise and also building the capacity in the, the supply chains and especially the local supply chains. Um, so finding builders, finding roofers, um, getting them to understand what's required to install insulation and to make sure that buildings are properly draft proofed. Um, I think there's the slightly unique thing about people powered retrofit um, as compared with some of the schemes that have gone before, we, we're kind of trying to tackle both the technical barriers, but also look at um, supply and demand at the same time. I think previously there's been, what, what just happened with the Green Homes Grant was there was an awful lot of demand, but maybe not enough infrastructure to meet that demand in the, the supply chain. So we're kind of working on, on both. And in terms of what's required, we think in this area of investment is really to help build that infrastructure to support that service, to get more people who are skilled as assessors and surveyors and designers and uh, installers. Um, 
because if you do that, then that really unlocks the potential for all of those people who are sat there with maybe money in savings account or money in pension pots that they'd like to invest in their homes. They're then able to do that with a bit more confidence. Um, and I would say on just on the, the climate justice um, and the just transition thing that's been mentioned, I think the really good thing about retrofit is that it does have a lot of these co-benefits. So we're tackling carbon emissions, but we're also tackling uh, employment. Uh, we're providing kind of skilled jobs um, that are local. Like this has to happen everywhere that there are houses. Um, and we are kind of conscious of that and looking to not just, obviously we can only kind of work so far in our local area, but we're looking also, we're partnering with other community energy organizations to replicate what we're doing elsewhere. Uh, one of them being Cumbria Action for Sustainability. We're kind of looking to replicate elements of the service with them. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of at the point where we're, we know what we'd like to do. We're just trying to work, build on it and scale it in the next kind of five years or so. Brilliant, um, thank you, Marianne. Um, great, uh, and I hope that's not an alarm meaning you're supposed to get out of the building. Um, no, there's construction work going on over the road. Okay, so. <laughs> no problem. Um, so brilliant, awesome overview there. Um, we're going to talk about some of these things in more detail, uh, and I'm going to fire some questions around to everybody as well. So I think um, I'm really curious about the uh, environmental uh, audit um, committee's recommendations and and why that fell so flat uh, with with Bayes when clearly um, there seems to be you know a growing evidence base that communities and uh, people powered organizations need to take a much bigger role in this uh, transition. Nick, what coming to you, maybe unfairly, but um, you know, you're involved in a lot of policy work. Why do you think that it's getting such a, a, a flat response? Um, perhaps I mean I mean this this is this is a it's, it's it's sad and it's really good that Rick brought that to, to our attention. I mean I think one one of the things is is, is potentially policymakers like to think about large, uh, easy uh, to deliver, low trans action costs big things uh, and obviously uh, one of the challenges of community energy is it's is by nature necessarily quite decentralized um, and 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 small in 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 that sense so so i think that the challenge is to show so how that community energy across the country has that huge impact um and not just community energy but uh, other forms of, uh, of of community enterprises we've heard from kingdom farm and so on um, and how that all adds up to delivering this, this the scale of the impact in terms of nature and energy and and, and society so so i think there may be maybe a perception uh, issue um at stake um and i think therefore the the question that we've been discussing is actually not only how do individual enterprises in in in, in different uh, countries, different parts of the country dealing with different things, sort of be successful, have they come together, as, as, as we heard in sort of zero waste, and how, how does that achieve that, that scale, so that um, community enterprise uh, is seen as a core strategy for delivering our net zero goals. I think that's perhaps a, potentially a perception uh, issue. And also, I think, therefore, we need to think about what are the particular policy tools. The British Business Bank is there to support uh, British SMEs. What is their role here? Um, we have this new infrastructure, UK Infrastructure Bank. They're, one of their roles is net zero and supporting local authorities. How could that then flow into um, uh, community energy? what is the role of all these different funds, levelling up fund and prosperity fund and so on. So I think there's a particular piece of actually being very, very detailed about the particular policy tools that would really enable this scaling up to happen. It sounds as though perhaps the sector needs quite a lot more firepower as well um, to you know, help promote what they're doing and also, like you say, connect the dots between all of the different organisations and, and hopefully you know, work that you're doing, Rick, is also, you know, helping to uh, accelerate that. Um, you know, is, is that, do you see that your end goal, your purpose would be to help to influence um, policy? Um, 
Yes, but indirectly. So uh, first and foremost, the intention is for um, like-minded practitioners to benefit from one another's experiences, uh, to encourage those people that uh, maybe one or two stages behind to catch up. It's really, to, it's a multi-local approach where we're very much focused on action and helping those people that have that first-hand experience share it more widely. I think as a result of that, it just increases the momentum uh, behind uh, change and that does guide uh, solutions. That does yeah. influence some of the top-down policy making, uh, not least when you have this level of community involvement, when you start to get this ownership, either literally or figuratively, then uh, policymakers and local politicians are in part part of the solution, but are also very influenced by this groundswell. So yeah. we are not, uh, as a charity, uh, driven um, by influencing policy directly, but we very much want to showcase uh, all these great examples as a way to influence it. Okay, so scale and speed seem to be quite important to um, perhaps get us to a point where the solutions that you're presenting are better recognized uh, and can get integrated into policy uh, in a more proactive way. And Andy, you talked about the problem of lack of risk capital and the time it takes you to get projects off the ground. Um, are you seeing any movement from um, some of the commercial organizations that you spoke about or, or the banks to play a part in providing some of that risk capital? Um. Yes and no. I mean, we're working with some really quite innovative, smaller commercial organisations who who could help us in this regard. Um, but uh, in terms of, say, mentioning the banks and whatever, I, I don't know if anybody, any any of you are listening to Mark Carney yesterday when he was uh, as part of this this climate action forum event. He he was talking yesterday, and he, you know, the person interviewing was you know the it's Honcho for environmental stuff for, for HSBC. Um, so, you know, they were getting loads and loads of publicity out of all that, but we don't have any contact with those sorts of organisations. Mm. I doubt they've, they've even thought about community energy. Right. So there's this gap, I think, between what's happening at the top and what's actually happening at the bottom. And it's, yeah, as you said, really, it, it's maybe it's, it, it's something about perception Maybe they yeah. just don't think we're doing very much. It's not really worth it. It's piddly. I don't know. So we're certainly seeing more movement amongst the foundations, I think, and more philanthropic capital. Um, so, you know, FX has brought on three match funders in the last year. So we've got a million and a half uh, to blend in alongside the crowd, which certainly helps to provide a boost. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope we'll see a lot more of that. But you're right, there's that early stage uh, capital, which is, which is really necessary. Um, and I'm sure Helen, you've also, you know, you struggle in terms of, you know, that early stage development money um, to get the projects off the ground. And when projects take two or three years, you know, for each one, obviously, you know, it limits the amount that you can do at one time. Is there anything, Helen, you are seeing from your perspective that could help to um, provide more funding to that area? Um, I mean, I think I think the way that we've set up our community share model um, is that people own, and someone's sort of brought this up a bit in the chat as well, is that you is that you don't we ask people not to withdraw in the first three years, and you don't get interest in the first. I think it's two and a half to three years and the one of the reasons for that is that it just really helps you to find your feet because the start of any business and especially food and farming it can, it can be quite a while before you make before you make that profit so actually just providing lowering the amount that we take in loans um you know and taking more from from community shareholders is, makes loads of sense um 
and yeah, I think and and I think also other funders. Uh, in terms of our development costs, funders are excited by this. They're excited by the fact that so many people are showing that they believe in what we're all doing. And I've no doubt that it will happen for Carbon Co-op as well or, or the retrofit, um, you know, that, that people are just like, yeah, this is great and we need to support you in, in making this happen. And people understand that it takes a long time to do something like this, I think. I, that's the, the feedback we're kind of getting. Amongst the sort of social investment uh wholesalers there there is recognition that that patient um flexible and affordable capital is is very much needed and i think that we just need to mobilize more of it to to help in this early stage funding um and perhaps that's a you know that's a call out that perhaps we need to do as an industry to um to try and get more support at early stages. Um, just thinking about, you know, on the flip side, we're hearing from government that, you know, there's gonna be this green bond that's issued um, and, you know, that's going to get potentially millions and billions of pounds into no doubt large scale projects. Um, what do you think the reception of that will be, Nick? Um, you know, how, how does that fit in with what we're talking about, which is a much more inclusive, uh, localised uh, sort of system? Well, I think the two are very compatible. Um, so the government has committed to issue £15 billion of green sovereign bonds. So that's debt um, that the government has used to, to pay for what it needs to do on, on, on green. Um, and this is going to be both in a way that um, pension funds can buy, but there's also going to be a, a green savings product as well that, that people could buy as, as, as individuals. Um, and we've been working uh, with, with the government and, and sort of inputting into its ideas so that what we find quite exciting is the government is committed to uh, actually report on the uh, social co-benefits of this green spending, uh, both, and this could be things like job creation, so the retrofit thing would come in really nicely there, uh, but also this, this, this phrase sort of levelling up. So I think a really exciting thing, this is going to be a series, not a one-off, is then being able to see how does this uh, public uh, raising of capital how does that then drill down to the community level? How could community, uh, how could some of this money that is raised in a, in a green sovereign bond, how would that then sort of filter down uh, to community enterprises and so on through, through government public spending? So it'd have to be linked to public spending plans, but that could be retrofit plans, um, that could be uh, renewables rollout plans, that could be uh, nature-based solutions and agriculture and so on. But I, I would see the two as being uh, connected. Yeah, well, um... I think we'd all like to see some of that trickle down effect. Um, I shall hold my breath and see whether that happens, although I'm sure we'll have to wait some years um, to see that. Um, now, listen, um, we could talk forever here and uh, I feel like we were just getting going. So apologies um, that we've run out of time already. Perhaps we'll have to have a step two um, session, but um, I just want to say, Thank you very much to all of our panelists today. Sorry if we didn't get to talk as much as um, we would like to have done. And um, fantastic congratulations to everyone for all the fabulous work that you're doing as well. And um, I hope very much that we can help support you do a, more, do a lot more of it as well. Um, and, and Nick, thank you to you for, for bringing the sort of more policy um, approach to us today. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. If there's any other questions or if we haven't got to them and uh, we can always uh, respond individually. So thanks again and um, join you again for another cup of club soon. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>